City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. This is the communications room with Lieutenant Andrew Baxter and others. <laughs> Drew, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Are you back this week? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, well, I don't know what you mean by back, but yeah, I still have a touch of uh, what Josh has uh, labeled the Clayton. Uh, I, I still uh, cough a lot, and uh, I don't know if I have congestion or uh, some kind of walking pneumonia, but uh, I'm I'm here. Uh, I just uh, I can't seem to shake whatever mung this is, but I'm uh, I'm happy to be here. I. I walked uh, um, um, on the earth this morning. I woke up on the right side of the dirt, I guess they say. Well, that's the right side. Why don't you tell <laughs> us what tonight's show is about? Tonight is jam-packed full of stuff. We're going to talk about the Louisville, Kentucky active shooter that occurred in uh, less than a month ago. It was uh, April 10th. It was a mass shooting at the old National Bank on uh, Main Street down in downtown Louisville. Listen, I've got a little tied at Louisville. i got to let you know. I was accepted into the... Uh, uh, SP, I was accept, accepted into the Southern Police Institute, the uh, administrative officers course. It's an in-residence uh, kind of three-month deal. Uh, but unfortunately, COVID struck. So we uh, we were kind of cut short right in the middle of the thing. And I had to finish the coursework at home. But uh, I, I do, my heart uh, belongs in Louisville. Uh, I had a lot of Louisville officers in my um, uh, in my class. And you know what? For reference, for a fl- frame of reference, while we were deciding or it was, our fate was being decided of whether they were going to send us back to our agencies or if we were going to continue on with the, cl- the coursework, the Breonna Taylor shooting happened right there in Louisville. And uh, our biggest concern was, as our classmates brought it forward, I sat right next to a homicide sergeant. There was an IA sergeant that sat in the back of the room. There was, uh, you know, two other sergeants in the in the room with us. And um our biggest concern, obviously, was the fact that this guy, who, who is now known as John Manningly, was shot and nearly died. And, and the whole class prayed for him and the whole nine yards. Uh, there was really no flap about um, the shooting itself. And then, of course, it took a whole different tone and tenor once the media got a hold of it. Um, you know, obviously, this wasn't intentional, and, and nobody goes into work that day thinking that this is what they're going to do. But So we are here to respond to the media's narrative about what goes on with police officers and uh, we also have uh, some news going on tonight and a special guest for that and a special news correspondent if you're ready, Drew. Otherwise, if I have interrupted you, I am sorry and go on. No, we do have a special guest correspondent. We have our friend Carly, who's usually in the chat, but she's been promoted to AAA tonight. She's up up in the uh, or up in the big leagues, I guess, of uh, the comm center. Carly, how are you doing? Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm doing well. Um my name's Carly. Uh, you might hear a dog barking, and I apologize in advance. Um, I used to be a dispatcher and have since moved on to corrections. Outstanding. Thank uh, you for joining two, us. Thank you for joining yes, us. Two very undervalued uh, positions. I, I admire your uh, your work. Like, you know, they're, they're really underappreciated. There's something that's happening in your native state of California, or something occurred, and I think you probably want to talk about it. What is what What happened the other night, Carly? Yeah, so Newsom has since used the Highway Patrol out there and the National Guard to combat the fentanyl epidemic. And I don't think he really realized the impact it was going to have on the department as a whole, primarily the comm center. So that particular comm center handles the entire Bay Area, all 13 counties in one room. They were short staffed when I was there. Um, They're still more short staffed. They've had an influx of people leaving, transferring different different offices, et cetera. I want to say they might be a little under 30% staffing and they were at 36% when I was there. So they're doing the jobs of like three people to one. Um, The San Francisco radio in particular is paired San Francisco County and San Mateo County with one dispatcher running it. They're supposed to be separate. Now there's usually a backup radio And that has also been paired with another one because they're short and they have to put it somewhere. Um, So if they're busy, so that's their backup. So now who's backing up the radio? 
primarily anyone you can get, hopefully, or yourself. Right. Um, so they put out a whole thing that the captains have been talking and they're supposed to not use the highway patrol radio. They're supposed to use the PD radio, which like, that's all fine and dandy, except that they don't speak the same language. We don't use the same 10 codes. Like unless you're going to plain language, they really don't know what they're saying. And so they have all this new task force going in and they're really not sure who to turn to that's going to help them out. So my friend was working the San Francisco radio and we had a nice little discussion on Saturday about how it is not going that well because she was told, you know, don't worry about it. They're not going to be coming up on your air. It's totally fine. Well, then one comes up like immediately needing help because usually people that do drugs are high at the time. Um, sure. especially when they're on fentanyl, they have warrants. They're known to make weapons. They're just like not the people you want to interact with on the daily basis, especially if you're short staffed. And so she had a 911 call at the time because they do answer 911s at the radio. And she had no one that she could pass off the call to because everyone's busy. And so she has an actual like medical emergency, not just someone saying their dog got loose. And then she has an officer that needs help and is requesting a tone and the cavalry basically, because this guy is known to manufacture weapons. And he was like, okay, well, here I am. It's like me, maybe one other guy, like, can we get some help out here? And so she's taken off guard. She was immediately told like, they're not going to be using you. Don't worry about it. And so now she's like, okay, they're using our air. We need backup. And their reaction is we'll just create another overtime space. Uh, well, you already don't have people coming in for overtime. How are you going to create another overtime space? That's right. primarily just helping her out. And the, the, yeah. this all goes to the, uh, the 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 disrespect that that we've been talking about from day one on this show. It's it's a matter of a, a couple things. Like uh, first of all, I'm sure that a cabinet surrounded Gavin Newsom, and he decided, well, we're just going to send a bunch of cops down to uh, San Francisco, or, or we're going to send uh, Highway Patrol down there. Um, and nobody really thought this through there. He's just like, well, this is how we get rid of the problem. But nobody included the communications people in there to talk about the actual problems when right. it comes to the logistics of this whole thing. So there's the first thing. And then the second thing, of course, is you're already understaffed as it is. So more officers means more work. And again, we can't uh, you, you can't stress enough to the public that you can you can leave a zone or two unmanned. Uh, with, uh, you know, with deputy sheriffs or highway patrolmen or, or local officers, you can't leave a seat unsat in a communication center because right. a hu human being has to handle the phone call and handle the radio. So um, it, it's all just kind of what I've been saying all along. Um, listen, they just like, we'll get the comm center to do it. And, and they just hand out the task because, um, you know, unfortunately, and fortunately, because of the resiliency and the and the uh, the um, I'm searching for a word, but I can't think of it. But the the resourcefulness of of the profession, of the people in the profession, they just somehow seem to get it done. But they never seem to get any of the glory, the credit, or the just the the recognition that everybody else deserves and everybody else should get. So, another classic example brought to you by Carly. Uh, keep your eye on that. It's a developing situation. You, you can't manufacture. The other thing is you can't just pull somebody out of the jail or somebody off the street and say, here, sit in this chair and, and answer the phone. Uh, it doesn't work that way. So after eight or nine months, maybe somebody will be comfortable enough doing that or, or talking on the radio or something. But it, it's it's just like it's not we're not talking about robots here. You, you don't just sit somebody down and say, pick up the phone. Hello, what's your emergency? Uh, there's a lot more that goes into it. So thank you for being here, Carly. Hopefully you'll stick around. We're going to talk a lot about uh, Louisville tonight, though. Uh, Louisville uh, is uh, in Kentucky. If you didn't know, there was a mass shooting that occurred at the old National Bank. Uh, five people were killed. Eight others were injured. There was a law enforcement officer Officer Wilt, who was just out of the academy, he was shot in the head, I believe, um, during that uh, thing, uh, during that shooting. Here are the victims here. We, I, I never want to go into a show without remembering the victims. These are the five that were 
uh, brutally murdered by the shooter. Drew, I'll read their names for our audio listeners. We have Tommy Elliott, Tommy Elliott, Joshua Barrick, Juliana Farmer, James Tut, and Deanna Eckert. These are five vivacious looking happy people that are lost to us now because of a senseless act of violence and uh, so many aspects of the media we focus on the police response we focus on the shooters so we want to remember those five people who went to work that day were trying to live their lives and come home to their kids or whatever was important to them and they're not home tonight and uh it's important to remember that we, we also want to remember Officer Wilt, who uh, at last check is making progress. He had, to, uh, he had to be transferred to a different hospital because of a pneumonia issue, but he was transferred back to University of Louisville. Uh, Louisville, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. Uh, but he uh, is transferred back and apparently making progress, which is great news. Uh, this was a, a horrible and horrific tragedy. And just to, to keep in theme with the way John and I kind of think and have done things since minute one, um, I, I'm not really going to say the shooter's name. I, I will tell you that um, he had a mental health issue, and uh, he was functioning in society. He he had a job at that bank uh, where where he ended up shooting five of his coworkers, murdering five of his coworkers. Uh, but I, I'm not going to speak his praises or anything. I am going to tell you that I, I'm not here dancing on his grave or anything. He's he obviously had a mental issue. Uh, there are reports from CNN of all places that say that he um, left a note and in his note, he talked about how he wanted to show how easy it was for somebody with mental health issues to get a gun like that. But uh, he took it a few steps a little bit uh, beyond that and, and murdered five of his coworkers. There were rumors that he was getting ready to be fired, but I don't know if those were. Do, do we really need, need proof of that in this country? I mean, no, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be crass, but I mean, it's like we have proof of that all the time. This guy added nothing to the discussion at all. And no. I hope that he's forgotten. Well, that's yeah, that's I'm with you. I'm just saying I'm not going to pile on. In other words, I'm I'm not a fan of active shooters, regardless of what people may think or say. No, but I, um, I will say I want to couch one thing real quick. It's just important. I said I hope he's forgotten. His mom does love him. He does have a family that loves him. We're going to address that in the show. So I, I hope that his act of violence and I hope that he won't be remembered for that. I hope that the people who loved him and lost him, I hope he's remembered by his family. Drew, go ahead. Yeah, that that's kind of where I'm going with that. Like, we're going to hear the 911 call with the plea from his mother. We're going to listen to that real quick. It's off of a new story from, I think, Fox Nation. And then uh, we'll listen to it all the way through, and then we'll kind of talk about it here. At uh, on the nine one one operator valves, where is your emergency? Yes, my um, I could have, my my son might be he could have a gun, and he's heading toward the old national at uh, on Main Street here in Louisville. Main Street, old national. Yes, uh, this is his mother. I'm so sorry. I'm getting details second hand. I'm running to it now. Oh my lord. Okay. And what exactly is going on with him? Why, what, what is he saying he's doing? I, I don't know. I'm getting this information from the room. He apparently left the note. I think he's on. And I think he's beside. He's, he's just not. Yes, hurry. Shut the door. Lock the door and come here. I, I don't know what to do. I need your help. I, I think he, he's never hurt me once. He's a really good kid. Please don't come up to him. Okay. And he said he was headed to the old national thing. Did he say what he was going to do there? I don't know. I don't know anything. He, he, but he, we don't even own guns. I don't know where he would have gotten a gun. Okay, so where did you get something. this information from? Who told you what's um, going on? His roommate called me. His roommate's very concerned. So this was, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, what's your son's name? It's all redacted. An employee there. At, at okay. How old is he? White, black, Hispanic, Asian? White, six, about four. Six four. Yes. Okay. All right. And what was your name, ma'am? What was, What is your name, ma'am? Is your telephone number? I 
I've got your name and your phone number in here, and I'm going to let the officers know that you believe headed to the old National Bank on Main Street and having... Okay? That's, that's correct. Okay. And, and please, he, he's not violent. Mm -hmm. He's never done anything. Please. Okay. And you don't believe he owns guns? I know he doesn't own any guns. Okay. And so did the roommate mention him having any weapons or anything? Um, I, I don't, I, I don't know, ma'am. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get into my car. My son's talking to me, and they're asking me questions about other things. Um, uh, and I'm shaking. Uh, I, I think maybe his girlfriend family had guns. Okay. I don't know. Maybe he saw them. I, I, I don't know. Okay. All right. I don't know what, well. Have your name and number in here, and if officers have additional questions, they'll give you a call back, but I'm going to let them know, okay? Oh, okay, so should I, what, what do I do, just go there? No, I don't want you to go to the location, okay? I'm, you what, don't want to? No, I don't want you to go to the location, ma'am. Okay? Um, we're it, going to the location. Right, I don't want you to go to the location. We have, a, we have a situation that's going on down there right now. We've already had calls from other people, and I do not need you to go to the location at this time, okay? It's dangerous there. You've had calls from other people, so you've already there? Yes, at Old National Bank on East Main Street, we have. And I'm advising you not to go to the location because it is an unsafe situation and officers are already at the location, ma'am. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, bye. Okay. Uh, Carly, um, obviously she's uh, begging and pleading. This is a desperate mother. Uh, how do you handle this as a call taker? Um. And immediately I would get the description name. I would try to get date of birth also, just so I can run him, see if he's known, um, see if he has like anything outstanding, if he's ever had any contact. I'd also run the phone number and see if we've had any prior calls from him. Um, see like if he's made statements before or if like his roommate had made other calls regarding him. Suicidal threatening statements, you mean? Yeah. John, what, uh, what, where would you pick up where she left off? Well, she's right. You know, uh, the dispatcher has to cut through all of the emotional turmoil of this. Okay, we have a mother calling a son in danger, others in danger, and <clears throat> the dispatcher has to focus on the most critical information, and she's trying to gather this. And the mom was saying, you know, I don't think he has guns, and the dispatcher – kind of gets around to it like okay how do you know all this and the reason for that is if she's getting this information second third hand it's the old game of telephone how accurate is this is right. there another person we should be talking to instead that knows more about what's going on his roommate who surely saw him this morning and his mom not necessarily and then finally the dispatcher is also playing it cool uh someone in the chats asked well doesn't the dispatcher already know about this she does but she's not going to say to this guy's mom yeah, we've already got police engaging him in a gunfight right now. Um, she just basically tells him, tells her to stay away. It's a mother's instinct to go to the scene. However, that's one more potential casualty. Uh, we've talked about how, why you wouldn't bring someone like that into a barricaded subject situation, the danger of all that. But so eventually the mom says, well, I'm going to go there. And the dispatcher has to tip her hand. We've already had calls on this. Drew, go ahead. No, that was uh, th that was the question. Uh, I think it was tactical that she d he didn't know if she knew or not. Uh, but, it, you know, it's revealed at the end of the call that she did know and she did a great job at playing it straight. Like she really just wanted to uh, keep be a calm voice, try to get as much information as she could, but at the same time, not divulge information. Uh, dispatchers, I think, in general are in the in the um, kind of ingrained or, or it's kind of ingrained in the training to to not give away too much information because you don't know who's involved or how deep they're involved. So you definitely don't want to just like John said, show your hand. Um, so I, I think she did a good job of, of controlling the situation, getting the best information she could, getting a contact number and then kind of relaying the information on. This was a tough call to take because you heard the mom. The, this is, this is why I have the empathy the mom is just trying to prevent this from happening. The mom is saying he's not a violent kid. He's not, he doesn't have any guns. She doesn't know what he's done. She doesn't know what he's about to do. Um, so, uh, you know, she's begging and pleading because I think just like that, one of the first episodes we did was uh, the Aurora, Illinois, uh, where the, the dispatcher was on the phone with the, with the, the grandmother, like, <laughs> this is just not going to turn out well. Like you just kind of know, 
uh, when things aren't going to turn out well. And that's, I think both the dispatcher and the mom had that feeling. And then it was kind of confirmed towards the end of the, towards the end of the call. So we, we've covered that. We've covered the part about, um, uh, what, uh, what the dispatcher was going through. Why don't we hear it straight from the dispatcher's, uh, mouth? Um, this is a, a very unique video that was put together by one of the news stations there. We'll give credit where credit is due at the end. Uh, and they talked to some of the people that were in the communication center at the, at the time. How are you doing after Monday? I'm okay. That was, that was rough. It was, it was chaotic. Um, but I'm okay. It was one of the calls that I'll never forget to, to sit there and listen to someone who's hiding and hear what's going on in the background is unreal. It's crazy. Walk me through that. She gets on the, the phone. What did she say? She said that there was a shooter, in, an active shooter inside. Eight or nine people have been shot. Uh-huh. Are you with any of them? Yes, but I'm in a closet hiding. I was trying to get as much information from her as I could, all while trying to keep her calm. Do you know what kind of injuries there are? I don't know. I just know a lot of blood. Okay. All while talking to her, you can hear, you can hear the person shooting in the background. <laughs> Is that shoot? Shots fired? Yes. <laughs> what does that do to you? At that moment, it did nothing because I was focused on getting what I needed to get for the responders. Um, now it's kind of crazy to listen to the call and hear that and think how things could have been different had he found her. You never have a moment days later where it just hits you? If I will have one, it hasn't happened yet. And I think maybe too it's because she survived? Possibly, yeah. I think we would be having a totally different conversation if she had not. We've got everybody coming, okay? Okay. How long will it be before they get here? They're already on the way. I know, but how long? Is there anything that you would have done differently looking back on it now? Just talking to her more at the end of the call. There was a lot of dead air. I wish I had just kept reassuring her that help was coming. What would you do if you saw her? Hug her. I wanted to hug her that day. I wanted to reach through the phone and hug her. I just felt so bad for her. Carly, your immediate reaction. I mean, I understand why it didn't bother her immediately because you're just in go mode. You're not realizing nothing's personal. The entire job's not personal. You can't take it personal and you just have to keep pushing on with it. But I also really hope they got a debrief. Oh yeah. That's I, a great point. Great point. John. Um, I venture to say with some arrogance because how, how dare I to presume, but when she said, I'm okay, I'm sorry, but I've, I've heard that from too many people who are functional and that they're compartmentalizing their anguish or they're disassociating themselves from it because they're still in go mode. You know, they're the next calls coming like Carly alluded to. And, uh, she says if that day is coming, it hasn't come yet. So she's not count, discounting the idea that someday this is all going to catch up with her someday. And I think eventually it does. And it either catches up with you while you're still on the job and that affects you while you're working. Or what I'm hearing a lot from people is once they're done at 911, all the phone in their head keeps ringing and it's all the people they've ever talked to and it all comes rushing back. So I guess I hope for her sake that she's got a good outlet, that she's got positive ways of coping with this. Otherwise, that was uh, one of the worst calls of her career. And uh, you can tell she's got a big heart because she wishes she wish even even when doing a great job, she wishes she had done better. Drew, I think that she was genuinely answering uh, the question that she she hadn't thought about it. Uh, I think that that reporter asking that question, uh, it probably hit her like a ton of bricks, like, oh, shit, this is going to this is going to catch up to me, isn't it? Like I really hadn't thought about it because she was, she's been in go mode. She uh, was working off of the, the adrenaline of, of handling an active shooter call and listening to the gunshots, by the way. Um, I, when I did that research project, when I ran the communication center, 
those were among the things that um, uh, the most traumatic things that dispatchers experience. It's hearing gunshots because you can't do anything about it. You can't see them and you certainly can't get, you know, crawl through the phone and try to shield anybody or protect them. And sometimes it's the last, you know, you're hearing gunshots that are being, you know, penetrated into the person you're talking to. So um, those are very uh, trying times mentally from a traumatic, from a trauma standpoint. Uh, but she's, um, she's also amazing at compartmentalizing it. It seems to me that she's probably got a couple of years on as a dispatcher. Um, and uh, it's anybody, any dispatcher worth or with any amount of time on has done this. They, they compartmentalize it constantly. And uh, this is kind of the importance of this show, not to not to try to gener generate self-importance, but I want to call attention to it. Like, you ask her the question, you okay? And she's like, yeah. And then uh, she thinks about it a minute or two later, and she's like, you know what? Maybe I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, these are the kinds of things I want to talk about. We're going to go into a uh, an interview with, a, I think he was a supervisor that day. It was just, I've never experienced it before. Um, and it's hard to describe, uh, to put a word to it, what it felt like. Josh Cothern was off the clock and close to home near Elizabethtown when he got the call from his boss, just moments after the initial 911 calls came in. I've got trucks switching over. We've got a report of an active aggressor, 333 East Main Street. No National Bank, multiple patients. It took me about 45 minutes to get here, but I, I came straight here to help. Manning the tactical channel, relaying witness information to LMPD officers. The call taker is trying to paint us a picture and the, the responders, the picture, they're trying to get us enough information to where we can efficiently give the police fire EMS, paint them a picture while they're responding to know what they're getting into before they get there. I'm, I'm going to try to get some other calls and see if there's people in the building we need to talk to, okay? But we do have everybody responding, okay? There's definitely a, a higher level of stress in situations like that, even for us. This was such a large scale incident with so many moving parts. I mean, LMPD had officers responding from all over the city. Everybody was coming down here. So it affected every single channel, every single call taker, the supervisors, you know, every every part of this agency was involved in that incident. Police is advising the building secure. At this time, EMS can approach. Cawthorn said both call takers and dispatchers are trained to keep their cool in moments like these. You have to put your emotions in a box, essentially, and set them to the side because you have to, you have to maintain calm for your responders, too, because that can, if, if I'm a mess on the radio, then that will get the responders, you know, everybody's getting amped up. He said the teamwork he saw Monday in and outside of that building helped cut the response time substantially. It definitely 100% saved lives, and that's what everybody in this room is trying to do. In Louisville, Brooke Hash, WHAS 11. Okay, so that uh, clip is from WHAS. Thank, uh, thank God she identified that because I was just trying to Google it to see where uh, where it came from. Um, so, Carly, what's your initial reaction about what he had to say? He's absolutely correct. I, you do have to just keep it cool because if you escalate, the officers escalate, the whole situation escalates, and your job is literally just to keep them grounded and just be like, hey, you know, you have someone here. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll figure it out. But I did like how he probably... I mean, I wouldn't doubt if he got any flack for trying to get her off the phone, telling her that we have other calls, other people we need to talk to, because at the same time, you need the information from them. But you probably have these people waiting like four or five, six minutes trying to get through. And like, it sounds cold hearted, but you you really do need to start fielding through them all. Yes, definitely. We'll get to that in a second. John, welcome back. Welcome. Yes. Uh, so there's no way to triage those calls. And when you have something like that, you know, we've discussed this several times with school shootings and other things, the number of 911 calls that are coming in, and there's no way to pre-screen them to know if there's good information coming in on a 911 call. And so you kind of mine each caller and then 
you have to move on. And it's hard because that person calling you, I mean, we, when we covered the, uh, the Farmington case, you know, that 911 caller wants the dispatcher to stay there, that calm reassurance. Uh, and, and you can't always stay there to do that because you need tactical information for those officers. Drew, go ahead. Yeah. Great, great story by WHAS, by the way. Um, you know, they covered the, the, the dispatcher and then the, the supervisor. I think it's important to note too, you know, what, what was the first thing he said? He, he was, you know, he lived in Elizabethtown, which is just outside of Louisville a little bit, but, um, he got a phone call and he had to come immediately back into work. He raced his 45 minutes to get back into work. So when we're talking about like Carly was earlier about staffing issues and, and the inability to retain employees and all these other things that go into it, sick time and, and unresolved trauma causing illness or injury to the dispatchers, therefore their seats open and uh, positions open. So when the big one hits, like at the, at the old national bank in Louisville, downtown Louisville, you're calling people in. Like um, we had an incident one day where uh, I think people underestimate the trauma that the, the dispatchers that are working at that moment experience. So we talk about how good they are at compartmentalizing it, but not everybody is. So you are essentially, uh, what we essentially had to do was call in the, the oncoming midnight shift at like 10 in the morning. Like, Hey guys, if you're available, come on in. I mean, it's, it's free, basically free money. Don't worry about anything else. Just come in and we'll worry about your shift later. We'll, we'll worry about staffing your shift later, but uh, we have a crisis in here now because uh, you know, what we were dealing with was uh, the equivalent of a five alarm fire. In my, my opinion, it wasn't a fire. It was a, it, it was a pretty bad uh, law enforcement incident. And um, some of the people that were working the radio just froze. And it was understandable. It was a very, very deeply traumatic incident. We had to pull them off the radio and set them aside. And you got to fill those seats. You've got to put people in their place. And uh, I think people underestimate that when it comes to staffing. And, and, and again, uh, we talked about at the top of the show, you don't just take the secretary from downstairs and say, okay, you're promoted to dispatcher. Now sit down and start answering 911 calls. It doesn't work that way. Not even seven or nine months later is she or he going to be ready for that position. So these are some things to think about. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that Beignet has joined the chat and uh, is part of uh, is, how old is the puppy? There are more questions about the, the dog. <laughs> she just turned four. <laughs> Outstanding. Okay. And, and she's uh, a social influencer, isn't she? She has a lot of big dog contracts. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> you could follow Binye the Corgi on Instagram at Binye the Corgi with underscores on Instagram. So go ahead and do that if you want to know the, the dog that's joining us in fourth place on this on the show tonight. <laughs> This is a little graphic. I'm going to warn you um, because of the shock involved. There's not going to be uh, like it's it's uh, blocked out like the, the real bad stuff is blocked out for sure. But, um, you know, uh, there are going to be bullets flying. So that's just the general warning. Uh, this is the body cam of the officers that responded. This is Officer Wilt, who's driving a Ford Explorer police car. His FDO is giving him directions on where to drive. Back up, back up, back up, back up. You can hear shots firing in the background. Stop, right there. Open the trunk. We're going to get the rifle out of the back. Officer Wilt is holding up his pistol to provide cover. While the other officer grabs the rifle out of the rear of the vehicle. Pull back the charging bolt, and they're walking towards the bank now. They're calling into dispatch, saying they're approaching. They're walking towards the steps. From the east side, they're behind a pillar for cover. And approaching. Yeah, I want I want to point this out. They're positioned behind a pillar for tactical positioning. They just want to make sure that they're not walking into an ambush. So they're kind of taking inventory of what they got uh, first, and then you see Officer. Well, Officer Wilt is the one whose camera we're seeing, so he's second in the in the line here, and they're going pretty much right in towards the gunfire, which is what everybody is trained to do. Okay, so they stopped the video 
for Officer Wilt, because at that point, I do believe he was uh, unfortunately shot, and I think he was shot in the head. Uh, however, as we discussed earlier, he uh, survived and is recovering. Hopefully, he fully recovers, but, um, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with him. This is Officer Galloway's uh, uh, body. Oh. So Galloway is the one that's taking the rifle out the back. He opens up the bag, pulls out the charging bolt, safety off, and they're already walking towards the building. It takes almost no time to get that rifle. You see from the point of view of his chest-mounted body cam, they're approaching that same pillar. We're making entry from the, uh, from the east side at Preston the Main. Walking up a flight of about 8 to 10 steps to approach the front of the bank. You can hear sirens in the background as other officers are talking. Officer Wilt is down. Galloway is tumbling. He's running away from the front of the bank now to get cover. Officer. Wilt is still down. So what you probably can't see is right at the top of the stairs is where Officer Wilt is. And they that's where they took fire. So he dropped him right where where he took fire. I, I do believe uh, um, the second officer tumbled down the stairs. So he has now found himself in this position where he's providing cover for the uh, for his partner who is laying right in the right in the basically in the sights of the shooter. Um, and he's trying to figure out a way to get a tactical advantage on the guy to take, you know, to neutralize the threat essentially. So he is at the bottom of the stairs and you'll see he kind of goes from side to side to try to look in. It's it's difficult to see inside the building because of the glare of the sun and the way the windows are. It's a lot easier to see out of the building than it is to see in. So now he doesn't have a good angle on the shooter. He's back behind another pillar on, on another side of the building. He cannot see Officer Hilt or Wilt from where he's at. Down below some steps, shots continue to fire. God damn it! More police officers are arriving on scene. He's trying to see his partner. He's hiding behind a pillar. He can't get a good angle on the shooter inside the building. The shooter has an angle on that officer. We need to get up there. I don't know where he's at. The glass is blocking him. Listen to the tactical breathing of the officer. He's forced to wait. He can't make any move from where he's at. His partner is down. He has to wait for backup. You can hear sirens approaching in the background. Louder and louder. He's looking around around the pillar, attempting to get any kind of a shot off at the gunman inside. The beep you're hearing is a reminder that his body cam is on. There's the tactical breathing. Adrenaline surging. He cannot see his partner. whole chorus of sirens as police officers converge on the scene. He's forced to wait for them. He cannot make his way back to his partner who's lying in front of the bank up some steps. Yeah, I think that he's got an eye on him like from, from the ground level. I, I think he yeah, I think he can see him we and I think that's kind of what he's like. But you can't see you can't see it from his, the body cam angle. Right, but from the did, body cam angle. I'm not there's sure a couple can, of go ahead. There's Drew. a couple there's a couple of things in the chats that I want to address. One being, um, you know, just look for the broken glass. Well, the, the entire building is glass. So uh, I think you'll see, and again, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I think you'll see that when they make it up the stairs that it's nothing but broken glass up there. Um, and so I, I do understand the, the thought and theory of if you break the glass, he you can see inside and he can't see out. It just, I, I, I tend to think that he's probably going to take cover as well. I think that probably is how this ended because I didn't, I wasn't able to see the exact shot of what took the shooter out. But uh, I do think everything that you're saying uh, is valid. Uh, that's law. Um, and then uh, there was something else that was here uh, that I wanted to address. But at any rate, I, I, I he, he's just, you, you can hear the frustration. He yells GD, uh, you know, he says the words and um, it, it's just, it's a moment of frustration. Like I really know that I need to go up there and get him. 
I also know that I need to bum rush the shooter. I also know that he's got the advantage on me. So the second I step out of um, from from behind the cover that I have right now, without anybody else here, no one else is going to know where to go or how to get there because he's got the tactical advantage on it. It's just a, it's a frustrating moment. I can feel it, you know, uh, in a sense, um, he wants to get there and save lives and, and, and take the shooter out like anybody else. But at the same time, he's just, <laughs> and, and the other thing is too, it's just the sheer confusion of this whole thing. When we trained active shooter, we made sure that we had plenty of gunshots, plenty of ambient noise, plenty of uh, loud music, plenty of people screaming, uh, plenty of people running at you that you don't know if they're the shooter or not. Um, and, and so uh, that's why I say, and I, I don't say it uh, callously, but um, I, I don't think that there are many civilians in this world that can handle active shooter training without urinating all over themselves, let alone an active shooter situation, which is why I take it very, uh, I, I don't take it lightly when somebody critiques an active shooter response. Uh, you know, uh, Uvalde comes to mind, but um, this, this is why I say what I say. People just don't understand the gravity of what you're dealing with. You know you're marching into your death. You're sacrificing yourself for everybody else. Um, you, you, you also know that there could be a way to do this where you take the shooter out, which is your mission. And that's what we're trained to do. So uh, there's just a total mind F, if you will. Still waiting for backup. Still breathing hard. Still couched behind the pillar. He's been moving back and forth, left and right. Trying to see around the pillar to see if he can see anything. He's shooting straight through these windows, right towards the officer. We need to be able to plate somehow to be able to get there and pull him down from the stairs. So they're talking about the plate, the the, the shield, basically. Like, let's get up there and rescue him. Is that, is that Blue talking? Yeah, Blue talking. Micah makes a good point. This has got to feel like an eternity when your rookie is down. God, don't have an angle. Gunfires exchange. Right the bank. I think I got him down. I think he's down. You're down. Drop, drop now. Yank him down the stairs. He's telling him to pull his partner down. Give him to safety. He would be the incident commander at this point, too. I think he's down. Not, not sure yet. He's going to take a look. We yeah. see Will. Suspect down. Get the officer. He's entering the bank. He has his rifle pointed at the suspect on the ground. Oh no! He's down. Get the officer. You see the suspect on the ground. The rifle's pointed out on the officers now inside the bank, stepping on glass, approaching him to make sure he's neutralized. Here's a bystander so watch, video. So watch, ahead, the, so watch the video of the guy across the street. Now, this is what I was trying to tell you about. Um, at this point, I believe Officer Wilt is already down, and you'll see the, the concrete planter at the bottom of the stairs that separates the two staircases where the uh, where the other officer is and you'll see him bounce in between the two um, you know from the left side to the right side to the left side he's trying to get the he's trying to get a good line of sight on the suspect to, to take him out essentially to stop the to stop the threat you also see cars in the foreground there's no secure perimeter at this point you have vehicles driving right by where gunfire is being exchanged and a police officer's just been shot we see galloway charging down the stairs and going behind the pillar this is taken from across the street we can right. see him going on either side of the pillar pointing his rifle inside of the building attempting to see if he can see the gunman inside so Primer it's, it's 
it's Go all ahead. surreal. You're, you're just like there are cars just driving down Main Street, literally. I mean, we're, we're and if if I'm not mistaken, this uh, very well could be taken from the inside of the Louis, Louisville Slugger uh, factory. That's right there. It's a it's like it's a tour spot, but it's actually where they make the bats. But uh, the, you know, they're taking the video from the inside, like they're probably in shock themselves, but there are cars just driving down the street. Like they don't know what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on. So think about the officer who's trying to process all of this and all of that's going on in the background. Like you just, you don't understand how overwhelming something uh, like this is. So there, there is no sound to this by the way. So uh, because they're inside or, or if there is, maybe they took the, the sound out uh, probably very wisely, but um, you see him, he's just kind of bouncing back and forth. He's taking cover behind the hedge and behind the cement of the, that the, the safety that the planter provides between the two staircases. Then he's waiting that eternity that Micah spoke of that it, it just seems like forever and ever and ever that, you know, nobody's going to get there. The other thing that's interesting about this is that we, you know, we have a officer standing there with with a rifle, and we can surely hear gunfire, and we still have a bystander filming this. You know, I guess if it was me and I was that close, I'm not sure I would want to be standing next to a big glass window with a phone. Yeah, I, I evaluated that. I mean, <clears throat> it's for sure that um, that uh, they're in a building at least, because you can see the reflection of the person yeah. taking the video on the phone. But you're right. Uh, you, you're essentially you're not in crossfire because you're not in between the two people with guns. But you, you know, just and by the way, that was a point brought up earlier. Um, you know, if you want to you want to talk about taking out the windows or whatever, don't forget that you're responsible for every bullet that goes out of your gun, and that's going through your mind. You don't want just innocent people coming off the elevator, and all of a sudden you're you, you're trying to break the window and you shoot two or three people. Yeah, uh, people might be trying to run out. Exactly. Right. And you've got a you've got a rifle with high velocity rounds. It's got penetration power. And like I said, there's no secure perimeter. We have no idea how many people are inside the building. Actually, if you watch that video again, and we don't have to replay it, at one point early in the video, you can see someone inside the bank standing up on the fifth floor looking out the window. So that bank still has people in it other than the gunmen. And they're all in danger. Drew. Okay. So, Carly, think about it. With the people that are inside that are still calling, um, how... How are you managing that as a call taker? I mean, I would I would want as much information as possible because clearly the officer can't necessarily see inside the glass. He doesn't know what he's really going into. He doesn't know if there's one shooter, multiple shooters. What if someone saw another person, like you said, go into the elevator and try to go up to higher floors? Like, we just don't know. So trying to gain as much information as possible and trying to give them as much as you can, then that's really all you can do. You can't make them drive faster, even though you'd really, really want to. Right. You can't make them teleport, right? Mm -hmm. John? Tactical dude had an interesting comment, and I only bring this up because I thought the exact same thing when he's behind the column. Tactical dude says, yeah, I wish cops could use suppressive fire. Um, Again, you know, we talked about the building being full of people, but when I the first time I watched this, that was my exact feeling. I was like, just empty the mag, keep him from pointing the gun again at the police officer who's down, keep him pinned down until people get there. Unfortunately, it's just not not a good tactic. Drew, did you have any thoughts on suppressive fire for police officers? Yeah, rules of engagement are completely different. Um, and, and let's let's okay, so let's talk about Uvalde for a second. Um, if you if they had stormed that classroom and, and this is a big, what if I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to debate anybody in the facts here, but if they had stormed that classroom and the guy had just murdered 21 children, they do not automatically get to shoot and kill that guy. They get to go in and eliminate the threat, but you have to evaluate it and make sure that it's a threat. It's still the same thing. It's, is he an imminent danger? I mean, is he an imminent threat to, of death or great bodily harm to yourself or someone else? Yeah, if he so kills if he's all standing, 21 kids and still throws the gun down and puts his hand up. If he's up, standing there with can. no gun in his hand, this is exactly what happened with the Buffalo Tops shooter. He shot everybody. He did all the damage. He laid his gun down. He walked out of the front door and took his vest off and just stood there. It's not an automatic execution. This is different 
in the sense that this guy is still engaging, especially as the officers were approaching. Um, they're still engaging. So suppressive fire is not uh, is not on the table because we're responsible for every bullet that goes in. Now, th there there may be a thought of, you know, I'd rather be. <laughs> I'd rather be tried by 12 than carried by six and, you know, trying to save a life or whatever. But you really have to remember that we're not trained to do that. The police officers aren't trained to do that. And on, on second, I mean, to even further that we're trained that whatever you shoot is you own. So if you hit a civilian a bystander, just because you were giving off the suppressive fire and there's, an easy way to verify that because you're wearing a camera on your chest. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a difficult call. It's, it's, it's definitely not a crazy line of thought. No. Uh, it's just different rules of engagement. And this is why I say anytime this argument comes up, military versus law enforcement, even, even uh, law enforcement in the military, completely different beasts. Yeah. Completely different training, completely different mindset, completely different everything. It's, John, you got it's, ju it's just interesting that, you know, he thought the exact same thing I did. I, I was watching that. I, I know that you can't use suppressive fire, but that was my feeling. And I'm, maybe that officer felt the same way with his rifle that, you know, that his partner, a rookie who's on his fourth shift, who's lying out there uh, between essentially between him and the gunman in terms of space, if not angle, and how much he's just waiting impossibly long for these, this backup to come. Now the backup of course is coming at extremely high speed. It's just, you know, as we've talked about on the show, even last week, you know, how long is two seconds? It's no time and it's an eternity. And he's waiting some considerable seconds uh, for backup to get there. And that's what he needs at that point when he's pinned down behind the column, he can do little to nothing to help his, his partner who's down and to stop the gunman. Yeah, it, it definitely would have come in handy in this situation, but it's it just it's not on the table. Um, anything else, uh, Carly? Uh, do do you feel that when this uh, suspect is neutralized, that the job is over, or is the job just beginning at that point? Kind of a little bit of both, because you still have to make sure that that's the only threat. You still have to secure everything. You still have to check on everybody. EMS has to fill everything. And then paperwork begins. Right. Uh, John, your opinion on that? Yeah, it's not over at this point. And, you know, there's so much chaos going on. We have the idea that there's, you know, a lone person in the building. But, you know, even as, as hostages are inside, if, you know, you're the SWAT team responding, you know, you have to, first of all, you have to debrief all those people. So you have to get them out of there safely. You also have to make sure that there's not more than one shooter in there. The last thing you want is to get one man down and breathe a sigh of relief and start clearing the building and then meet up with someone else. So they, I'm sure the tension remained high for quite a while after that. Well, I would submit that this is where the job begins because yeah. you've now eliminated the threat and you've, you've restored a sense of stability. However, the things that you don't think about that the common citizen doesn't think about, maybe even sometimes the common um, dispatcher or, or officer doesn't think about, where where is EMS going to park? Where are the fire trucks going to park? Where They've got to be staged exactly somewhere outside of the hot zone, but nearby so they can respond. Are you going to have some type of landing zone? Do you know which hospital that they're going to go to? Do you know which way to tell your command staff that needs to get in there to start running the show, which way for them to get in? Are you tell, are, are you having, uh, and again, this would be 10 times worse in a school. Who is going to be handling the crowd of loved ones? Who is going to be handling the media? Where do you want them to stage? There's probably about 10,000 things to think of, uh, in that moment and nobody does it alone, but it is kind of on, on, it, it's basically on a commander or com a, a, a command staff of sorts who will team up with the medical, you know, the EMS fire people and, uh, start making decisions. But th this is a mass casualty event. You're going to need to, I mean, there's a major university nearby. There's, uh, th th there's a lot of other things to, to think about. You got to notify them to make sure that, you know, those students are safe. And then you've got, uh, with that being a major university, it's, this is going to hit CNN anytime now. So the calls are going to start flooding in from the parents of the, um, 
uh, uh, the kids that go to University of Louisville, even though they were, you know, 10 or 15 miles away from where the shooting happened. So uh, a lot to think about, especially from the communication standpoint, um, because that's where all the requests are going to go. Uh, you know, people are going to make those phone calls or people are going to call on the radio and uh, setting, you know, set up those marshalling areas or, or staging areas. It, it all goes through one place. And if you don't have enough people to do it, then what are you going to do? Or you don't have the qualified people to do it. What are you going to do? You know, the dispatchers definitely aren't going home soon and neither are poli the police officers. But, yeah, it's a logistical nightmare, like they're saying in there. Uh, everything that has to get done after that the communications room is not going to calm down for hours, even just handling media requests, people calling in, that's going to be going on the rest of the day. Yeah. I, I'll, I, if I had a crystal ball or if I had a, a rewind button, I would say there are plenty of people that stayed for 24 straight hours uh, out there, either at the scene or in the communication center. There are also people that left and came back to the exact same, essentially the exact same chaos that they left. Because it doesn't, it doesn't really, it, it goes in waves. It may, it may like calm down for a little bit, uh, but then there's a whole different level of, okay, now we have to start processing the scene. Okay, now we have to start, you know, the investigation. Okay, now that we're going to be doing a search warrant at the guy's house. And now that we're, there's just so many waves of, of, uh, and layers to this investigation and, and, uh, and to getting care to the people that, you know, that were injured. Uh, just a lot to think about. Um, any other final thoughts or comments on this, Carly? Well, even getting like the calls from the family, if if you haven't been made aware of where they're going in my policy, we couldn't really give you information on whether or not they were a victim yeah. or a shooter. So we just had to be like, well, you know, <laughs> contact this hospital. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's that, that's an amazing. I'm sorry, John. I'm going to give you a point. Uh, I'm going to give you the mic in a second here, but that's an amazing point because. There is a lack of communication often between the people on the scene and the people in the communication center. Like, what would you like us to tell the families that are calling? There are plenty of families calling in. What would you like us to tell them? Let's develop a standard line. Like, we don't know where your loved one is. This is where, you know, the American Red Cross is set up at this location. If you go, if you respond there or if you're able to call this phone number, like, you need something standardized because it's not fair to the Carleys and the Johns who are literally dealing with people in sheer panic because they don't know about whether their loved one was inside, whether their loved one was one of the victims. They don't know anything. And you got to tell them something. And, you know, sometimes people on the scene get so upset when you, when you give them the wrong information or you tell them to go to a hospital and, and they weren't even at that hospital or look, we don't have a crystal ball up here. You know, you, you really have to keep the communication center in communication. John, I promised you, go for it. Well, just echoing what we said before, we don't disseminate information. In fact, when people ask us for stuff, our, our, our kind of our shields immediately go up. Like, what am I allowed to say and what not to say? And you'll kind of let them, you know, finish out their inquiry. And then it's like, you know, and, and the worst thing is, in my experience, is when you know for sure that the person they're asking about, if if they've the police officers on scene have already run their driver's license or whatever to identify them, so you have that information right in front of them, and they say, you know, where's my dad? And his name, you know, is, and they give the name, and you say, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know at this time, because you don't give death notifications over the phone. Yes. You know, it's not the role of the 911 dispatcher to do that. We need a police officer there to talk face to, to the, face face yeah. to face next to next of kin and i've had to do this before where someone calls me and says we can't find my dad we don't know where my dad is and i have had to hold back to say you know not that i wanted to at all but it's just like i heard your dad die about 30 minutes ago you know it's it's so hard to to be approached by the family they want answers and there's going to be so many people that first of all call for the loved ones but then so many people who are just you know their brother who went to a movie and has his phone on silent mode and he has no idea what's going on and they're and in the chaos and in a big city like Louisville, you know, they're they're like they're going to be worried about their brother and they're going to be calling in. And even though he's fine, you're you're fielding that call. So you're dealing with a whole bunch of extra stuff that's so outside of what you're dealing with. And then this tragedy, too, you know, because you do know what's going on, you know, and you'll eventually you'll find out who is down and and then you're going to start organizing things. And so when someone calls you and says, I'm looking for my dad and you know, he's down, you know, how do you tiptoe around that? Okay. Okay. So you're, you want some information. Let me get your name and phone number. I'm going to have a police officer call you. And even that phone call is a prelude to a visiting in person. So it's like, 
you can't tell them that their loved one's fine and you can't tell them that their loved one has passed away. Now you're in this game of like, my God, get a police officer in front of this person as fast as possible. And that can right. be difficult because it's, in my case, the, the person who was calling just got off an airplane and that no one was meeting them at the airport. And the airport was in a different jurisdiction. So it was like, we can't get a person in front of her fast enough. And I don't even have control over the people that we need to send there. It was so frustrating. Drew, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think some of the old salts sometimes take that for granted too, or maybe even the new newer detectives. Like when they make a notification face to face, it's a lot different. You know, you're able to to exude a little empathy, and you know, you can read body language, and they can read yours, and um, and so they can easily downplay like what was the big deal, you know, like but they're not dealing with the raw emotion of somebody calling John from the airport who doesn't know anything. And that's the first phone call they made, you know, and uh, <laughs> he's, he's having to basically juggle chainsaws at that point to try to not tell the whole story. And uh, it's just not as easy as people think. I mean, you know, people are very emotionally invested in their loved ones and they just want an answer and they have somebody on the phone who can give them the answer, but the person on the phone is not able to give them the answer because they're told not to. Um, it's it's kind of underestimated, I think, how how tough that can be. Carly, uh, what are your I, thoughts on that? I wanted to just have another dispatcher. Uh, have you had to do anything like that before? Or, you know, I'd hate to put you yeah. on the spot, but you yeah. know, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, no, I've had it a lot actually because people share their locations on their phones, and they'll see on the news. I see this major crash on the interstate. And my family is mapping there. Can you give me any information? And I'm like, yes, but no. Like, I'm not going to, like, should I go there? Absolutely not. Do not go there. Like, would you normally stop on the freeway? No. And, like, just knowing, especially if they're deceased, then we really don't give them that information. And we didn't do the notifications. We had the sheriff's office do it because they were the ones that handled the corners. So we would be like, okay, well, you know, call the sheriff's office. Like they might have more information because they were allowed by policy to do it over the phone and we weren't. So it was like, it was our way of still giving them the answer they wanted without breaking our own policy as well. Yeah, I had to do that. And that's frustrating where you have to sound like uh, ignorant and competent at the same time. It's, and it's all in the midst of like the worst thing that this is going to happen to this person for a long time. Uh, I want to end on a kind of a, not, uh, on an upbeat note. There's no positive things that come from an active shooter incident, but uh, a friend of the show's, uh, Dexter Pitts, was uh, interviewed for this case from the mental health angle. I, I have a lot of respect for Dexter. If you haven't read that book called I Am Pitts, uh, I strongly suggest you get to it and get through it. It's, uh, it's I, 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 I joked with him about um, th there, there are pages in there, particularly Pitts 216 is what I call it. Uh, page 216 is a, a very poignant uh, set of words that that he wrote. He should be very proud of. So uh, here's Dexter on a news uh, on a newscast. Officers. Old National. Oh boy. Plan came through Monday morning. The hearts of other officers dropped, not knowing if their friend was the one critically shot. And one of those people is St. Matthew's police officer Dexter Pitts, who ran to the hospital as so many others did. He shared those moments with troubleshooter Natalia Martinez, who joins us now with the story. Officer Dexter Pitts is a veteran and served for LMPD up until just recently. He opened up about something we rarely hear about. 333 Main Old National Bank. Another caller advising possibly eight to nine people have been shot. I heard the call come over the radio, and I'll be honest, I thought it was a fake call because, like, this has to be a prank. I felt like my heart stopped because, in, in, in my mind, I'm also thinking, like, who is it? Who got shot? You know, then how many people are dead? How many people are wounded? And, what, and more than anything, what can I do to help? Those were the thoughts running through Dexter Pitt's mind. The former LMPD officer used to ride the beat downtown, going by the old National Bank building a thousand times. Louisville Metro Police Department has always known that it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Pitts, who now works at another local police department, remembers training for an active shooter situation, visiting buildings downtown, learning their layout. The only thing you can do, he said, is rely on your training. We're making entry from There's no hesitation. 
These guys got out of their cars and went straight to the gunfire. I mean, you got a four, a rookie officer four days on the job, did not hesitate, did not hesitate, got out of his car and ran towards gunfire. And now he's fighting for his life because of it. Pitts rushed to the hospital where officers gathered, unsure if their friend was even alive. He was there when another call came in. Two people shot at Chestnut and 8th Streets. Nobody hesitated. Everybody ran out of the auditorium, back into their police cars and back onto the street to go serve the citizens of Louisville. The headlines have not been kind to LMPD, but Pitts hopes the narrative will expand to include a bigger, more objective picture. We know that there are some officers that are in uniform that aren't great officers, but my God, man, you've got to look at all the officers that responded yesterday. That's what we should be using as a broad brushstroke to paint this the police department with LMPD. <laughs> Courage, bravery, I mean, we saw it there on display. What do you want the public to know? I want the public to know how much your officers love you in the city because you don't run into danger for people that you don't love. That simple. These officers love you. And regardless how you feel about them, no matter what you say to them, no matter what you do to them, you can curse them out, call their mama any name in the book, and guess what? You call 911, they're going to come, they're going to be there. Pitt says there are other stories just now coming out, like an off-duty officer who was a couple of blocks away and ran to the bank the second he heard. Pitts has a podcast and has written a book about being an officer in today's age. We have so that's our boy Dexter. Uh, great message uh, on his part, in my opinion. Um, that kind of puts a little bow on the uh, on the segment. We do have a caller. Let's see if uh, we can. T- <laughs> Let's see if this works. We'll take it. It's an anonymous yeah. caller. Hold on one second. Yeah, Pitts is a fan of the show. He's been on night shifts and other episodes before, and I've read his book, and his book is absolutely amazing. Good evening, caller. Can you hear me? Turn up, turn oh, up the podcast you. in the background. Hey, hello. Oh yeah, yeah, all the way down. <laughs> What's going on? Who's this? Well, uh, I remain anonymous, but uh, John knows who I am from the Great White North. So, uh, great <laughs> episode tonight, guys. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> How's it uh, going tonight? Yeah, no, sorry. It was a really good show, and uh, I think that. Pitts is a really great guy. I'd like to get my hands on that book for sure. I don't know if it's available on Amazon or or what. Uh, you, you, I think you can probably go to DexterPitts.com if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Josh will look that up for you and put it in the chat. You, you uh, can also I, listen to it on Audible. I got uh, the audio oh, version right. of the book, and Dexter Pitts reads it in his own voice. And you just listen to him. He's got it, first of all, a fantastic voice, but no one can put the passion into what he wrote like he can. And so when he talks about loving people as a police officer uh, the book is filled up with stuff like that it's an absolutely fantastic book uh, i i have to ask uh, because i'm i'm approaching this with trepidation are you calling to gloat that the toronto maple leafs eliminated my tampa bay lightning from playoff contention yeah i mean uh, mr matthews there is a little bit of a legend in his own right and kind of overshadows all else in that arena so i think that goes without saying uh this call is costing me about five dollars a minute so uh i had to make this worth it but well, uh very well done good show and uh yeah hey thanks so, buddy thank you uh for for reinvigorating our uh viewership in the great white north i'm sorry it's costing you five dollars a minute but let's remember this is five canadian dollars so it's only cost <laughs> you 75 cents all right thank you for calling yeah uh, that's right yeah, yeah 69 cents yeah no problem <laughs> nice all right. Car- so just- Carly actually is a big hockey fan too. Did you want to weigh in on the Maple Leafs there? Did you know tonight's the first night of the CFL draft? Go Canada! CFL draft tonight. I don't even know why anyone's watching this when the CFL draft is going on. Let's it's, go, uh, Blue Bombers. I, yeah, the last time I checked in, uh, Doug Williams and perhaps Doug Flutie were in the CFL. If you want to leave us a voicemail during the week, here's what you need to do. It's been crawling at the bottom of the screen under Carly and under Beignet the whole night. 848-COM-911. That's 848-266-6911. Nice. Uh, you just call that number. You can leave a voicemail for us anytime. As you heard, our neighbor to the north called, and we, we talked to him directly because we don't fear what anyone has to say. 
uh, we, uh, in full disclosure, I do fear what you say. I just, uh, we'll, we'll take it as it comes though. Let's listen to Dimitri's voicemail. How about that? Hey, Drew. Hey, John. Hope you're all doing well. Um, uh, this is Dimitri, uh, on the, on the chat. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the membership, John. I love you to death, but I did want to ask, um, what is going on with the whole George Floyd situation? Because I, I like to listen to both sides of the political spectrum and different people argue different facts. And so I'm, I'm not exactly sure where to get the correct information because I mean, I've heard a lot of good things and I've heard a lot of bad things. And based on what I've heard, he sounds like a bad guy, but I also don't know him personally. So I can't really make that judgment. I just, you know, I would like to know the facts and I would like to know where to get the facts because, like I said, uh, different people are arguing different facts. So I, I just, I don't know exactly what I can trust. I mean, I guess that's part of the problem with the media these days. But anyway, um, I, I love the cops. I support you guys. And I really hope that everything goes well for you. Stay safe, brother. Bye. Thanks, Dimitri, Dimitri, that that is the most honest thing I've heard in a long time, and I appreciate uh, somebody who is on the search for facts. Here's here's what I'll tell you: um, what you hear in the mainstream media is generally slanted, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely false. But I, I, sometimes it is agenda driven, and it's uh, it's not completely true either. There is a documentary that was uh, put together by Candace Owens. Candace is a notoriously conservative uh, woman, and she's very, very smart. Uh, so she is often um, taken out at the knees simply because she holds conservative values and conservative views. And she carried the alternate to what the mainstream media tells you about the George Floyd uh, what happened in the George Floyd incident. And I, I just want to point out, you might have to pay a couple bucks to watch the documentary, but it is very eye opening one. And two, uh, I don't, I haven't seen anybody counter or question the facts and, uh, research that she did. And I think once you watch it, you'll have a whole new perspective on what happened that day. George Floyd may have been a wonderful person. He may have been a wonderful guy. He's done some bad things in his past. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean he's a bad guy. He's also dead. I don't know that he should be uh, glorified as a, as a hero simply because he yelled, I cannot breathe. Um, everybody subsequently, after his death, that is resisting arrest yells, I cannot breathe. Uh, and they indicted somebody in Tacoma, Washington, simply because they yelled, they happened to yell, I cannot breathe before they died, um, which I think is unfair. Everybody wants to compare their in custody, in custody deaths to uh, George Floyd, and they want to compare the officers that were part of them making lawful arrests to Derek Chauvin. And I don't think that's an, un, I don't think that's a fair comparison. I'm not even 100% convinced that Derek Chauvin uh, should be in prison. I, I knew for I knew pretty much that he was going to prison uh, because it's uh, it's only an unfair system when certain people are on trial. Uh, any other time, it's completely fair. So, if uh, it, this is a very long answer to a very short question, Dimitri, but uh, look up that Candace Owens documentary and judge for yourself, um, and and take in any uh, you know take in Van Jones' opinion from CNN and take in. Uh, CNBC's opinion. Uh, but uh, again, the, it gets back to the research and what research has been challenged, and you won't find any challenges to Candace Owens' uh, thoughts. Anybody else? Carly, uh, I know this is putting you on the spot, and this is pretty outside of what we normally talk about here, but if you're included, you're a dispatcher, and you get to have your say, if anything. Go ahead. I don't have too much to say, mostly being that I still work in the field. Okay. <laughs> right. That's all right. I, I, still work, I still work in the field too. And uh, so I understand why you would say that. I just wanted to give you your shot. Um, I 
I want to give a little context to this because Dimitri called because last Friday during the Mistretta breakdown, which was a case where a police officer was acting lawfully and was still compared to Derek Chauvin, uh, we, he and I were talking in the chats and uh, he was talking about how uh, he doesn't know what's going on with George Floyd. And I said, you know, I don't appreciate the all the iconography and all the murals and everything about George Floyd because this is a man who pointed a gun at a pregnant woman at one point. OK, and I made the argument that just by mere virtue of the fact that I have never done that, that I might be a better candidate for a mural. I'm not a candidate for a mural, of course. I'm just saying I have never done that before. So was he a good man? Was he a bad man? Like all of us, he was both. OK, so he, he did something horrible that I just mentioned, but he was also better than the worst thing he's ever done. You know, there were people that loved him. So God certainly loved him. All that bear saying. So you can't distill it all down to was he a good guy? Was he a bad guy? He was doing bad things at that gas station that precipitated that event. Uh, if he was if there was fentanyl in his system, he was doing drugs, which is against the law. And you can make a moral argument about that or not. But when it comes to where am I going to find truth in my media resources? Drew makes a good point to check everywhere and compare. I take a different approach and that I don't believe anything. <laughs> and 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 this is not this is not just to say well I don't know what's going on in the world okay but when someone tells me something on the news whether it's Fox CNN or any other source I think to myself critically why do they want me to believe this you know what agenda does this fit into like if I believe that what purpose would it serve for them what purpose would it serve for who, who their who their commercials are you know money is certainly controlling the news and so you have to wonder things like that and so. You know, and then like Drew said, you know, listen to someone else and say, see what they say and why they're saying it. And I think the most important thing is just to critically think for yourself, not have the person on TV decide for you. Talk to other people. And basically, whatever point is made, whether it's by CNN, Fox, your Aunt Sally or whoever, but it's got to stand up to rigorous debate. Now, where has debate gone in this country? It's gone by the wayside. If you disagree, you're a racist, you're a xenophobe, you're a transphobe, you're a hateful, you're whatever you are. But if you're going to have a belief or if someone is going to assert something, they've got to be able to withstand at least some level of scrutiny. So like I said last week, you've got to be a bit of a devil's advocate, okay, which is unfortunately code for being a dick but you have to you have to say no matter who's talking you know why is it that that's your belief and what about this and offer a counterpoint if you have one to anything they say and see what comes out of it and and it's only through that critical thinking and that scrutiny and that process that you can get to a point where you find out what might be close to the truth keeping in mind that you'll never know the complete thing true um yeah, let, we'll just end on this note because uh, Tyler made made a great point. He recommends watching the full body cam without any kind of reaction video uh, and look into the breakdown of facts and watching the trial highlights. It's going to give you more information to develop a, an idea of the facts, which is true. Uh, I, I will tell you this. Um, this uh, became obviously the hot hotbed of, uh, of racial tension, um, yet – race was not brought up one time during the trial and and so was he murdered because he was a black guy well uh, if you ask the media yeah absolutely if you ask the actual people that had to try this thing and prove beyond a reasonable doubt no not, had nothing to do with it so uh just i think we can unanimously agree without jeopardizing any of our positions in in life or at, at work uh, Carly, you were a dispatcher. John, you're a dispatcher. I've answered a few 911 calls myself uh, as a dispatcher early in my life. Have uh, any of you at any time asked, hey, before I send somebody to you to help you, what color are you? Have you ever asked that? No. Even on this even on this call, replay it. Uh, when the dispatcher is asking for the the race of her son, again, she goes, is he white, black, Hispanic, native? Asian Pacific Islander, that dispatcher's ready to continue to expedite the process by saying, you know, which of these Uno cards is the one that belongs to your son? <laughs> you know, it's, and, it's, they don't put them on the spot because they know that it's going to cause hesitation. Drew. Officer Wilt, Officer Nicholas Wilt is fighting for his life and recovering, thank God, uh, was charging into a building where an active shooter was taking place. And I guarantee it wasn't all white people in there. No, and, so, how, and how the hell about that guy and his fourth shift and no hesitation, no fear. He's he's driving and doing everything as FTO tells him, gets his pistol out and he's all ready to go. Uh, 
just prayers for him that he recovers soon. I don't know how this is going to affect the rest of his career, but a hell of a guy. He's on day four and he's already doing things that I, I dare not do. So uh, if, if there's a GoFundMe out there, and I think there is for him and possibly other people who are dealing with that, I encourage you guys to seek that out on your own because you're intelligent if you're listening to this show. So just go find it. <laughs> Use your dispatch skills and locate a piece of information. And we encourage you to support those guys, particularly Officer Will, because uh being shot in the head and recovering he's got a long road ahead no matter what's going on with him drew right uh and make sure you vet that uh go fund me and uh go fund yourself john okay so if we could we're gonna call it a night carly thank you you've been an amazing guest the the uh the chats were active they were happy to hear from you hopefully um uh you'll join us again john did you have one more thing yeah, Carly has a, a parting message. I promised her that oh. she would get into it. She, she, has, she has a controversial take that she wants to make about an upcoming holiday in May. I'll just Go yield the floor to you, Carly. I don't know what controversial topic I'm supposed to make. I mention. thought you said you were going to say hi to your mom for Mother's Day. Oh, no. She just asked me to be on camera instead of just like a secret voice. But hi, Mom. <laughs> oh, happy Mother's Day since I put you on the spot. Well, the news. <laughs> Good grandmother is going to have a wonderful Mother's Day based on all of this uh, fame and fortune that we've uh, and attention that we've drained or that we've poured on her uh, from uh, Carly and Beignet, the Corgi, John, myself. Uh, we thank you for joining us. Uh, turn off the news and love your neighbor. Good night, America. We love you. <laughs>